Hi guys, welcome to our next lesson. So in this one, we're going to be talking about three different progressive presidents, Woodrow Wilson, William Howard Taft, and Teddy Roosevelt. So by the end of the lesson, you should be able to explain how American president's foreign policy reflected American imperialism, right? And you need to know the differences between the three. So let's start with Theodore Roosevelt. So he served as president from 1901 to 1909, and he became president after the assassination of uh, William McKinley. In foreign policy, he advocated for a stronger army and navy and increased American intervention in Latin America through the declaration of something called the Roosevelt Corollary, which I will talk about in, in a bit. And this was uh, to the Monroe Doctrine. And he also helped to construct the Panama Canal. And his domestic program was known as the Square Deal, which promised protections for consumers, workers, and the environment. So a little bit about his early life and career. He was born in New York to a wealthy family in 1858. He was sick, pretty sickly as a child, um, who grew up you know, determined to improve his health and stamina. So he became athletic over time through a dedicated regimen of exercise. He was a boxer, he did rowing and hunting. He actually graduated from Harvard in 1880 and started at Columbia Law School in New York but he actually dropped out in order to run for public office. And a fun fact is his, his niece, Eleanor Roosevelt, would go on to marry his distant cousin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who you will learn about um, in the next uh, upcoming units. And she became the first lady of the United States in the 1930s, Eleanor Roosevelt. And here is a picture, uh, his White House portrait, as you can see uh, on the right here. And so he uh, quickly rose through the ranks of, of the political ranks, right? He made his mark as an opponent of corruption in business and politics, and he gained fame across the country for his role in leading a volunteer cavalry regiment called the Rough Riders. This should sound familiar to you in the Spanish-American War. And he was elected governor of New York as well. And then by 1901, he had ridden his popularity as the hero of Cuba into the position of vice president for President William McKinley in William McKinley's second term. And then McKinley was assassinated less than a year after being reelected. And so Teddy Roosevelt became president of the United States at just 42 years old, and he was the youngest man ever to hold the office. So as you can see here, speak softly and carry a big stick. That's actually one of the most famous uh, sayings from Theodore Roosevelt. So as president, he was a proponent. He, he was an advocate of increased American presence in Latin America and in the Pacific. So he believed the United States should have a powerful army and navy and that by having such a powerful military, its very existence would deter potential threats. It would cause others countries to question and hesitate to, to attempt to attack ever. So speak softly and carry a big stick. You will go far is something that he said frequently. But his foreign policy was more active than just a show of power. In, um, he, he did advocate for and get the United States to build a canal across Central America in order to secure dominance of the seas, right, the Atlantic and Pacific. And so Congress approved a bill to construct a canal in a region of Colombia called Panama. And when Colombia rejected the American terms for control of a canal across the isthmus of Panama, the United States Navy, actually under the orders of Roosevelt, helped the rebels in that region of Panama to break free from Colombia and establish a new nation of Panama. And so the Panamanians, they accepted uh, the American help and the American terms as a result for the new Panama Canal. And that's how and why the Panama Canal uh, exists. And Roosevelt advocated even more American intervention in the affairs of Latin America when he announced the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. And this corollary basically stipulated that the United States would intervene in the financial affairs of Latin America whenever necessary in order to prevent European nations from having any form of economic 
hold or control over Latin American countries. And remember, the Monroe Doctrine stated that Europe needed to stay out of the Western Hemisphere entirely. They shouldn't be um, taking territories in the Western Hemisphere. And then so the Roosevelt Corollary went further and said, not only that, but the United States can intervene in the financial affairs of Latin America. So it's an important term to remember for the test. So at home, Roosevelt was known as the champion of the square deal. That was what his domestic program was called. And uh, it was an energetic domestic policy. It was based on the principles of the progressive era. And, you know, Roosevelt was very sympathetic to the little guy. And he embraced the progressive goals of bettering society. And so his domestic program, which was known as the square deal, consisted of the three C's, consumer protection, control of corporations, and conservation. So there was a lot of pressure from the American public who had read, you know, Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle, right, which went into nauseating detail about the unsanitary conditions in the meatpacking industry. And so Roosevelt threw his support, uh, because of this pressure, he threw his support behind the Meat Inspection Act of 1906 and the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. And remember, the, both of these laws required the federal inspection of meats and prevented canned foods or, or drugs, medicines, from being contaminated or mislabeled. And Roosevelt also worked to, to reduce and to eliminate the abuses of giant corporations. So it was a shocking move to some people who were alive at the time um, who were, they were used to the government siding with big business during this era when Roosevelt decided to take the side of striking coal miners in 1902. And he actually threatened to use federal troops to take over the mines if the owners did not improve workers' wages and hours. Um, and they ended up actually doing it. And Roosevelt also went after corporate monopolies and he earned a reputation as a trust buster. So he sued uh, and litigated and helped to uh, pass reforms, sign reforms to eliminate unfair business practices in the railroad, meat, and sugar industries. And then Roosevelt's, one of his most important achievements was in environmental um, co conservation as a progressive, as a dedicated, he was a dedicated outdoorsman. He feared that the beautiful lands of the West in the Western United States might be steamrolled in the industrial era's boundless greed for land and raw materials, right? Remember, that raw materials are so important for industrialization, but he was afraid that uh, too much industrialization and factories uh, taking all these raw materials without having any sort of protection would ruin the lands in the West. So during his presidency, he set aside 230 million acres as public land, including forests, national parks, and wildlife refuges, um, which is why you're able to go to places like Yosemite today or Yellowstone. And so although, you know, he could have stood for re-election, he was very popular, he could have stood for re-election in 1908, he had promised not to run again after his success in his election in 1904, and he kept that promise not to run again. But when his protege and his successor, uh, who was William Howard Taft, who we will talk about more in a bit, uh, when his successor raised tariff duties, raised tariffs, and he opened up some public lands for development, Roosevelt became furious. And so he threw his hat into the ring for the election of 1912 as the presidential candidate for the newly formed Progressive Republican Party, which was often called the Bull Moose Party, because he would say he said things like he was as strong as a bull moose where roosevelt would say that about himself so it's not really shocking that because <clears throat> republican voters were split between uh, taft and roosevelt that democrat woodrow wilson ended up sweeping to victory in 1912 in the election so let's talk a little bit about uh william howard taft right so uh taft he became president in 1909, and he, ch he chose to adapt Roosevelt's foreign policy philosophy uh, to one that really reflected American economic power. And this became known as dollar diplomacy. So he announced basically his decision to substitute dollars for bullets in an effort to try to use foreign policy to secure markets 
and opportunities for American businessmen. So it, it wasn't this, exactly the same as Roosevelt's threat of like violence force using the military, but Taft did use the threat of American economic power and clout to try to coerce and manipulate countries into agreements that would benefit the United States. So although he was, you know, his successor to the presidency, Roosevelt's successor, he was less inclined to use Roosevelt's big stick. And instead he, he chose to use the economic might of the United States to influence foreign affairs. So something that was very important to Taft was the debt that several American, Central American nations still owed to different countries in Europe. And he was afraid that the debt holders in Europe might use the monies that were owed by Central American nations, use it as leverage to use military intervention in the Western hemisphere. And so Taft was afraid of that and he moved quickly to try to pay off those debts with US dollars. So, you know, this made Central American countries indebted to the United States. And it was a situation that not all nations wanted. Like when one Central American nation resisted this, um, he responded with military force to achieve the objective. So this actually happened in Nicaragua when the country refused to accept American loans to pay off its debt to Great Britain. So Taft sent a warship with Marines to the region to pressure the government to agree. And he also, you know, when Mexico considered the idea of allowing a Japanese corporation to gain significant land and economic advantages in Mexico, uh, President Taft urged Congress to pass something called the Lodge Corollary. And basically it was an add-on to the Roosevelt Corollary. And it stated that no foreign corporation, no foreign company other than American ones could obtain strategic lands in the Western Hemisphere. In Asia, uh, President Taft followed the policies of Theodore Roosevelt. He, he really tried to bolster China's ability to withstand Japanese interference. So he tried to make China more powerful and maintain a balance of power in the region. And you know, at first he experienced success in working with the Chinese government to develop the railroad industry in that country um, through arranging financing for it. However, efforts to expand the open door policy deeper into Manchuria was met with resistance from Russia and China. And you know, it was limited there. The American government's influence in Asia was limited and its knowledge about the intricacies of diplomacy in that region. Um, and because of that, he, he noticed that he reorganized the US State Department to create geographical divisions like the Far East, Far East Division, the Latin American Division, in order to try to develop greater foreign policy expertise in each geographical region of the world. And remember the open door policy. This policy was that we sent notes to these imperialist nations like Russia and Japan and said that they must share their trading rights with the United States and China, right? That we need to have access to China like an open door. So Taft's policies, although they weren't based on military aggression, like Theodore Roosevelt, did create problems for the United States, both at the time and in the future. So Central America's indebtedness to the United States would create economic concerns for them for decades. Um, and it also caused nationalist movements in these countries to grow, right? And for them to become more resentful of American interference. And then in Asia, his efforts to mediate between China and Japan really only helped to create more tensions between Japan and the United States, which will obviously lead to World War II. And, and it also didn't succeed in creating a balance of power. Um, uh, Japan's reaction to all of this was to consolidate its own power, to grow its own power, maintain it, and to expand its influence throughout Asia. So as his presidency came to a close, the United States was pretty much on its way towards being an empire. And the world really perceived the United States now as the dominant power of the Western Hemisphere. And this perception wouldn't really be challenged until the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Um, and so 
the like the United States had also like showed its interest in Asia, but it was still look, searching for an adequate approach to like guard and foster its interest there. And it it also his policies introduced um, new approaches to American foreign policy from not just military intervention, but to economic coercion, to just the mere threat of force, right? Now let's talk a little bit about Woodrow Wilson. So Woodrow Wilson was the 28th president of the United States and served two terms in office from 1913 to 1921. He was a progressive Democrat and believed in the power of the federal government to expose corruption, to regulate the economy, eliminate unethical business practices, and improve the general condition of society. And so during his years in office, another thing to remember is that the United States federal government was feder um, segregated and the KKK experienced a revival. And then his second term, which we will talk about in an upcoming unit, was dominated by the First World War, World War I. Uh, and you know, even though he campaigned on the slogan, he kept us out of war, uh, it really was impossible for him to keep the United States out of war. And so we'll talk about his role in World War I, our role in World War I in an upcoming unit. So let's talk a little bit about his rise to power. So he was born in Virginia in 1856 to a very religious family. He was one of the founders of, uh, his father, I should say, was one of the founders of the Southern Presbyterian Church. And his religious upbringing is what helped to shape his political views and his view of the world. So uh, he actually grew up in Georgia and South Carolina. So he's from the South. He was the first Southerner to become president since James Polk in 1848. And he ran on the Democratic ticket in the 1912 presidential election. And he won. And he campaigned on a new freedom platform, which was this domestic program, which promised banking tariff and business reform, while also saying he would respect individual freedoms and private industry. Now, his first term in office, once he was in office, he pursued an agenda of lowering tariffs, right? Tariffs, remember, are taxes, right? It's on importing, exporting goods. He helped to create the Federal Reserve System. He championed antitrust legislation and improved protection for workers and established the Federal Trade Commission to crack down on mon monopolistic business practices. And these policies really reflected his faith in the progressive movement, which really sought to use the power of the federal government to regulate the economy, to expose corruption, and to improve society right, by addressing the negative effects of industrialization. So um, the first act here, right, we have up here is the Federal Reserve Act. It was an act of Congress under Wilson, uh, while well, Wilson was president, and it created the central banking system of the United States. And it also granted uh, the, it, the legal authority to issue currency. That's why we don't have different money in different states. That's why we all have uh, one central currency, right? And it gave the Federal Reserve System the ability to issue that currency. And then um, he also pa helped to pass the Cl Clayton Antitrust Act. And again, this, this was uh, created um, to outlaw business practices such as price discrimination and price fixing, as well as expanded on previous antitrust laws like the Sherman Antitrust Act. And the goal was to hold individual corporate officers, corporate leaders, owners, right, responsible if their companies violated the laws. Um, and it also set like clear guidelines for corporations that had previously been benefiting from like vague laws in the past. And the other thing was the Adamson, Adamson Act. And, uh, you know, this was uh, in response to a national railroad strike. And so this act approved by Wilson prevented a strike by increasing the wages and cutting working hours of railroad employees. And so it actually helped Wilson to gain a lot of union support for his reelection. And um, yeah, so those are a couple of the things that, that Wilson did during his first term. And here he is taking the oath of office in Washington, DC in 1913. So this was his, from his first term. And let's continue talking about th this first term here. So on the civil rights front, the Wilson presidency pursued 
I would call them regressive policies, not progressive, but regressive, going backward. So he worked with Southern Democrats to segregate the federal government. And this was a setback after years of African Americans making advances in the civil service. They, they were working in the, in the government. By segregating the federal government again, this represented a huge step backwards for civil rights. And during these years, the KKK experienced a major revival and President Wilson actually aligned himself symbolically with the KKK by ordering a private screening of a film called Birth of a Nation. And this film portrayed African Americans as savages, as criminals, and the KKK as heroic enforcers of this just and humane racial order, right? And of course, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, uh, and several religious groups, both black and white, they stepped forward to condemn him and to condemn Wil Wilson's segregationist uh, racial agenda. And you can see here this quote, it says the white men were roused by a mere instinct of self-preservation until at last there had sprung into existence a great Ku Klux Klan, a veritable empire of the South to protect the Southern country. And that's a quote from President Wilson there uh, demonstrating this. Definitely a setback. Wasn't progressive in this regard, right? So let's talk a little bit about his diplomacy, his, his foreign policy, right? Um, so let's talk a little bit about this. He really continued the U.S. policy of intervening in the affairs of Latin American nations, including Cuba, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Panama, Nicaragua, and Mexico. And he did this based off of something called his moral diplomacy. So he believed in moral diplomacy. And what that meant was he believed the United States should use honesty and cooperation with foreign countries in pursuing foreign affairs. And that the U.S. had a moral obligation to spread democracy around the world. And what this meant was that Wilson supported leaders of other countries who he thought supported democracy. And so you can see this quote here. It says, I'm going to teach the Southern, South American republics to elect good men. So in principle, he wanted to avoid the aggressive stance that Teddy Roosevelt had taken towards Latin America. He avoided that big stick policy, right? So he had negotiated a treaty with Colombia in which the United States apologized for its role in the Panama Revolution, right? And um, besides that, though, he didn't really shrink away from intervening on behalf of American values in other ways, right? Clearly, you can tell by that quote there at the bottom. So between 1914 and 1918, the United States intervened in, throughout Latin America. And these were called the Banana Wars. These were a series of occupations, uh, police actions and interventions that involved the United States in the Caribbean and in Central, Central America. They really began in 1898. And the United States conducted like military operations in Panama, Honduras, Nicaragua, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and Mexico. And this policy really didn't end until the withdrawal of troops from Haiti uh, in 1934. So it went on for a long time. And really, it was driven by economic concerns. That's what these banana wars were driven by, because of the connections between American business interests in the region and these interventions. So uh, the United States really, it, it also advanced its political interests and its, its sphere of influence, including control of um, the American built Panama Canal, and, which was really important to global trade and naval power. So in Haiti and the Dominican Republic, first American troops occupied Haiti between 1915 and 1934. So like, uh, what is that, 20 years almost, forcing, they forced the Haitian legislature to choose a presidential candidate that was selected by Woodrow Wilson. Um, in the Domin Dominican Republic, he ordered an American military occupation shortly after the resignation of the president of the Dominican Republic, who was called Juan Is uh, Isidro Jimenez Perea in 1916. And so the U.S. military really worked uh, with wealthy Dominican landowners to try to suppress this guerrilla force, which was known for its brutality toward resistors. Um, and that's what they were sent in to do 
to help suppress this guerrilla force, right? And um, this fighting went on for years. The other thing is the Nicaraguan and the Brian Chamorro Treaty. Uh, so from 1912 to 1925, the United States had pretty good relations with Nicaragua. And the United States provided, you know, military strength to ensure Nicaraguan government's stability. And um, this treaty was, was signed between the two nations under and ratified under uh, Wilson's presidency. And it was named after the U.S. Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan. That's why it says Bryan there. And then General Emiliano Ch uh, Chamorro, Chamorro re representing the Nicaraguan government. And so under the terms of this treaty, America basically acquired the rights to build any canal in Na Nicaragua in perpetuity. So any canal that was built in, th in that country uh, would be acquired by the United States. And this treaty was renewable on a 99-year option to establish a naval base uh, there. And so for 100 years, that's how long they would have uh, control of it. They, they'd be able to lease it, right? This arrangement didn't last. for uh, it, it was eliminated in 1970, but that's just one treaty, that one example. And here is under Wilson's directions, you can see U.S forces occupied here the Dominican Republic. Uh, this is U.S. Marines in the Dominican Republic in 1916. Now, let's talk a little bit about the Mexican Revolution and U.S. intervention there. So the United States intervened in Mexico throughout the Mexican Revolution, which took place for about 10 years, from 1910 to 1920. And they did this to try to protect American national security and economic interests. So. The Mexican Revolution was a, an armed conflict, began in 1910, and it was an, uh, it began with an uprising led by a man named Francisco Madero against um, this autocrat, uh, Porfirio Diaz, and it lasted until about 1920. And over time, the revolution changed from a revolt to a civil war with the end coming into sight only after the Mexican constitution was drafted in 1917. So uh, the re relationship between the Mexico and the United States at this time was really chaotic. So for economic and political reasons, the American government really supported those who were in power already in Mexico, whether it was legitimate or not. And so prior to Wilson's inauguration, the United States military uh, used threatening action against Mexico. They threatened action against Mexico if the lives and property of Americans living in the country were endangered. Actually, Pre President Taft ended up amassing troops on the border, uh, but he didn't actually allow them to intervene in the Mexican Revolution. Um, the Congress opposed that. So there are two prim primary motives for this intervention uh, under, under Wilson's presidency. There was anti-Hispanic ideology, which basically justified U.S. military uh, imposition of order, right? So they were basically saying the United States military needs to bring order to this Mexican chaos, supposed chaos, uh, and it was driven by this anti-Hispanic ideology. And this was fueled by pressure from American businesses who feared Mexican political revolution would jeopardize their business interests. And then at the beginning of the 20th century, the United States citizens and, and corporations, it's actually known that about 27% of Mexican territory was owned by Mexican, I mean, US citizens and corporations. So with all that investment in Mexican land and railroads, mines, factories, and other ventures, the revolution really hurt the Mexican economy and it pushed Woodrow Wilson to intervene and try to, he tried to protect American interests there as a result. And then the first time the United States really sent troops into Mexico uh, during this revolution was in response to something called the uh, Ipiranga incident, uh, when the United States intelligence agents uh, discovered that a German merchant ship was carrying illegal arms to Mexican President Huerta. And so Wilson ordered troops, U.S. troops, to be sent to the port of Veracruz to prevent the ship from docking there. And this led to a fight, a conflict between Huerta's troops and um, US forces. So 
the ship ended up being able to dock at a different port. And this really upset Wilson. And Mexican officials in the port of Tampico, they arrested a group of sailors. This was later on uh, in 1914. And one of them was taken from his ship. And so thus he was taken from U.S. territory, one of the U.S. sailors that was taken. And so there were peace talks that they were trying to, to, to have, but they failed. And the U.S. Navy ended up bombarding Veracruz, Veracruz and occupied the port for seven months. And some people think that Wilson really just was trying to overthrow Huerta uh, because he, he hadn't really, he refused to recognize him as Mexico's leader. And really this incident, the Tampico affair, really destabilized uh, Huerta's regime and it encouraged the rebels to continue to, to fight. And so U.S. troops eventually did leave Mexico, but the incident had already had worsened uh, already tense relations. Now we'll get to Pancho Villa and some border clashes. So there was an increasing number of U.S. Mexico border incidents uh, early in 1916, and it really culminated in an invasion of American territory on March 8th, 1916 by a man named Francisco Pancho Villa. And he had about 500 to 1,000 men. And they, they burned army barracks and robbed stores in, in New Mexico. And even though US forces, they were able to repulse the attack, but 14 soldiers and 10 civilians were killed. And Pancho Villa became the personification of basically mindless Mexican violence and banditry, right? And so in response, President Wilson sent forces commanded by a man named General John J. Pershing into Mexico to try to capture Villa. And his campaign wasn't really successful. He pushed in deep into Mexico, but Villa was really deeply entrenched in the mountains of northern Mexico, and he really knew the terrain very well. And so Pershing was forced to abandon the mission and to return to the United States. So. Troops were withdrawn from Mexico by February 1917, but not before virtually the entire U.S. regular army had become involved. So as a result of this, uh, you know, we had an increase in tensions, an increase in anti-American sentiment in Mexico because of this, these clashes. Uh, the National Guard became federalized and concentrated on the border um, before the end of the affair. So... There were some long lasting changes because of this. And you can see Pancho Villa here. He's second to the right on this, this image here. And that's actually gonna be it for, for this lesson. So let me know if you have any questions and I'll be sure to try to help you.